Good evening. Wow. How do we start? Such an amazing evening that we're about to start right now. My name is Rashid Shabazz, and the Campaign for Black Men Achievement. It's my honor tonight to host and be a sponsor of this event to honor Chantrell Lewis's amazing <laughs> street style. Uh, this is also, I want to thank the Brooklyn Museum and Aperture Foundation, and particularly Alicia Boone for, particularly for allowing us to be here this evening. I also want to just say that this is not our first time in partnership with Aperture and the Brooklyn Museum. Um, back in 2011, 2012, we partnered with them around another project called Question Bridge Black Mills. And so I'm happy that we're part, continuing the partnership and the relationship. After watching the film, my, my, all my thoughts and everything that I had hoped to talk about just reconfigured itself. So I want you to be patient with me. But one of the things that I was thinking about is just how beautiful black people are. Yeah. 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 As an African people, as black people, uh, we're trendsetters, we're originators, we sample, we remix, we remix again, we, we appropriate, we take, and then we recreate, and then we also put back into the word, world constantly. And one thing that is so valuable, I think it was Chantrell, and tonight we're gonna get a slice of just one black existence because we're so multifaceted as black people, but this idea of the dandy, I think for Chantrell, and I don't want to speak for her, she will speak later, is so rooted in love and black love. And so I want to start there and I want to welcome the speakers and panelists for tonight. I want to first ask to come to the stage Ignacio Juarez. <laughs> Felix, as he corrected me. <laughs> and he's a uh, trendsetter himself, multifaceted uh, haberdasher. He is a model. He's also a designer. He's also run his own invention shop for a long time. He's also an uh, elder to a number of individuals in this space. And so we want to thank him. Can we round of applause? Next, I would like to ask if Darnell L. Moore will come to the stage. And many of us, yes, yes, let's give it up for Darnell. <laughs> Darnell is editor at large at Cassius and One Digital Platform. He is formerly a senior editor and correspondent at Mike. And for the time I've known Darnell, I think the most important thing about him is not only his love for black people, but he's been a voice and advocate for Black Lives Matter, as well as the LGBT community. So can we give him a round of applause? I would like to ask Aviola O.K. to come to the stage. Aviola is CEO. and publisher of OK Africa. OK Africa connects a global audience to the African content through compelling content and high profile cultural events. And prior to OK Player, he had, he's a recovering Wall Street. Uh, I don't know if he's recovering, but he's, he, he's not no longer on Wall Street. And so uh, without further ado, I want to ask my sister, my friend, uh, Chantrell Lewis to please come to the stage. She's worked on this project for so long and before I sit down, I know this has been a labor of love for her, 
And I'm just very thankful to Aperture Foundation for seeing the value in bringing this book to life, uh, a journey that began so long ago here in Brooklyn and seated here. And for those who don't know, Chantrell is a curator, she's a researcher, she's a lover of culture, she's done so much for so many. She's also the author and writer of this book. And she's, most importantly, in addition to all those things, she's a Howard grad. There's always Howard in the house, so I had to give Howard a shout out. And then there's, uh, in addition to that, she's also a graduate of Temple University. So not to belabor this, I'm going to take my seat and begin this conversation. So for you, if you have not gotten the book, I think there are some books on sale this evening. There's only a limited edition of the books that have been printed, so you should try to get your copy. And there's only a limited edition here tonight, and I think there's about 500 people here, so I think there's 100 books. So I'm just letting you know. <laughs> so this picture here, we pulled out the book, and I want Chantrell to tell the story of how, why this book is so important. She tells the story in the book, but for those who don't know, this is her brother, Sanford. And so, Chantra, I want you to start. Tell us the journey that you've taken. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna click through the pictures, but I wanna sit here for a second with your brother. I'm a little emo right now, so y'all have to bear with me. Um, I have to start by saying my better phone, hey, go, my better phone, Sean, go, kawo, kabi, o, I had to get that out. My better phone, yeah, my job, my better phone, no, bye, lot. my better phone, shum, my better phone, na, leg, I am here on the backs and the shoulders of my ancestors and the Arisha that guide me, so um, I had to get that out. This handsome young man is my little brother. Some of you in the audience have the pleasure of having met Stanford, uh, who actually did not like the name Stanford because he made him feel like an old man, a young black boy growing up in New Orleans with this very old man. But Stanford came into this world as an old man, right? <laughs> old man, like he's older than me. I'm like, boy, you know you my little brother, right? Um, Y'all know I'm from New Orleans. In case you didn't know, you will find out tonight. <laughs> so, growing up in New Orleans, this old man comes out of my mother and is obsessed with dress. His suits, his Kenneth Coles, I mean, dude had like a line of Kenneth Coles, like polished in his closet, nobody could touch his Kenny Coles, right? It was a source of pride for him. And I mean, his, his kangles and his bow ties, and it was just like so taken with how my little brother was so committed to dressing. Even in the book, I talk about a time for my debutante books, you know, those of us black folks in the South, just a little bougie, not too much, just a little. Um, <laughs> particularly in New Orleans, you know, we make our debut, we come out. So I met my debutante bow, my, you know, wedding gown on, being presented. And we're taking these family shots, and Stanford, the photographer, has him to nail because he's the youngest, right? Dude was mad about it. Like, you got me kneeling in my good suit? I mean, he was just, his face was all frowned up, like in a, in a photo. And I mean, that's my brother, right? And even when the uh, exhibition opened in Chicago, Stanford walks in with his like, but I, well, I didn't even know it was him. I just saw this sharp dressed brother with his head on. I'm like, dang, that brother look good. I wasn't checking him out like that because I had a man, my husband at the time. But I'm just saying, dude, dude was dressed me sharp, right? And then he turns around, it's my little brother, you know? And so that, you know, that's my, my entree into this world of dandies and growing up as a black girl, middle class, in New Orleans, being surrounded by uh, these glorious examples of black men in my family, and Stanford, you know, is one of them. So this is the one picture from his... First communion, we were Catholic, you know, prior to me being a Shango priest, I was a good Catholic girl. <laughs> good old Christian Catholic girl, and my mama tried to remind people. You know she was Catholic, right? She grew up in the church. <laughs> <laughs> And this beautiful couple here. This is my grandfather's sister, um, Mama June, um, the late Mama June Valle, and her husband, Uncle Robert, uh, my great uncle, um, who 
you know, I just have to tell y'all, Mama June and Uncle Robert, so they're married. I go to the house in Elders. Mama June is like telling me, well, what's your mama doing? What's your grandma cooking? What's your, this one cook? While he's telling me, yeah, and I was in the Congo and I knew Patrice Lumumba. And she's looking at him, rolling her eyes, and she's like, yeah, so what you said your mama cooked again? That's Uncle Robert and Mama June. And, uh, you know, to this day, Robert, um, Uncle Robert, you know, gets dressedly, you know, sharply dressed. I mean, even though he just sits in front of the television watching the news, arguing about politics, you know, this is Uncle Robert, you know, uh, 80 something years later. So. Oh, thank you. I want to um, briefly dive into the idea of the day of being. And so I pulled this image because I think it captured some of where I want to take us in the next 20 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Ignacio, you talk about this actorial journey um, that we take. So I want to ask you, what is a dandy? Just so for those who may not know by now what a dandy is from the film, I want you to say what your idea of a dandy is, but I want to turn to Ignacio to share his journey and also talk about this idea of the dandy. So I have to shout out Hanif Abdul Rahim who actually photographed this image. There were 14 photographers who uh, were in the inaugural exhibition, and so this is one of this was like the you know hallmark photograph from the, the first iteration of the exhibition, and uh, I think this speaks to the quintessential Black Danny, right? Is a black man, a man of African descent, or a woman, um, or someone who doesn't fit in that binary, who. Uh, takes European, you know, a sharply cut uh, a suit and Africanizes it. And so the black dandy is a trickster. He's a, he or she is a rebel. He or she is someone who is very clever I and mean, very conscious and political about how they get dressed and how they're uh, showing out and showing up in the world when they're walking down the street because they're very conscious of how people are perceiving them. They're also someone who finds immense pleasure. Shout out my 20, Joan Morgan, who talks about pleasure a lot. Uh, you know, they find so much pleasure, or they get pleasure from how they dress, right? And I think that's something that's very African. It's something that's in us in terms of like, you know, it's, it's beyond respectability, because there's lots of respectability rooted in dandyism. But um, in today's contemporary context, I think we forget about us as an African people, like before we even contacted with, you know, we're in contact with white people, we were getting dressed up. And we were doing it by ourselves. And so even in the absence of whiteness, we're still dressing up, we're still regal, we're still beautiful, we're still powerful, we still, we're still making statements, whether spiritual or political, with how we dress ourselves. And so for me, that is what the daddy is doing. He's taking something like those jazz musicians in New Orleans did with jazz. He took European uh, instruments and they created something entirely new because we're always innovating as a people. And that's what black daddies are doing today. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Ignacio, you and I had a conversation that was very informative and I want you to share a little bit about your journey. But in the film, there was a moment where they're talking about how you dress. And I also, at some point, we'll get to Darnell talking about this as well, because I think it's relevant. But the idea that dress can either save your life or you can be killed based on what you're wearing. Now, I think that's, a, there's a lot to unload. It's a little problematic to really think about that. But in the moment of Black Lives Matter, in a moment when we know Trayvon Martin, the hoodie symbolized so much for so many to get organized. Can you share a little bit of your journey and then also contextualize that statement that you were having in the film? Well, um, growing up, of course, like, uh, growing up in the so-called hood, how they, and that's another word appropriated from us. Um, it's really neighborhood, but the, by the use of just the word hood, it creates uh, an image of hood lump or a hood of lungs, you know? So I fight that word. I call it a neighborhood. I don't call my place a hood. I call it a neighborhood. Um, so just to start from that premise, it's a long tutorial journey. And I know, like a lot of you, I've made the mistake of putting on the wrong outfit or not matching it well or not wearing the right suit or not wearing the right tie or like things. So, you know, we make all these mistakes, and that's part of the enjoyment. But um, beyond that, the, 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 this great suit 
or the great pair of shoes that you wear. It's a long tutorial journey, but there's value, there's power that comes with that cloth. Like stylus resistance, uh, like the Zutsu. In LA, they did it as resistance, but yet they still look good because there's a power in that cloth. But with that power comes a great responsibility as to how we're supposed to behave. The hip hop style, the baggy pants, doesn't have any power in the sense that it doesn't open doors. Like when I was a kid, I think I shared this with a lot of people, and I used to play with my friends. Like I, I would dress up and say, I'm going to walk into that building, and they're going to open the door for me, and they're going to let me in. And I'm And I showed them, I said, See, I'm dressed like this, and you're dressed like that. You go to the door and see what happens. Because it does put a value on us. We've always had a value put on us. From before slavery, we had a value. And then when we got emancipated, we still had a value because our vote didn't count, so it had to be three quarters. So we, we added, they added that value to us. And then if we don't look the part, you know, like, like my mom would say, don't go out with those pants, uh, on, you know, wrinkled, or that shirt wrinkled, you know? Uh, it was an image that your family instilled in you. Like, I grew up in Harlem, so I got to see the Sunday uh, parade of people. And I got to see people that worked at night, because a lot of people did work at night. But during the daytime, oof, hot steppers, looking really good, dressed to the nines. And again, but that took years, and it's a long journey, and we, you know, we adapt and we, we get ourselves to that point. And I started with, like, Many of these kids in South Africa, I started with thrift items. My mom was a seamstress, so I sewed and I took things apart and I reinterpreted them to fit my body. Like Botan was talking about how the pants didn't fit our, our butts, basically. You know? Um, you know, and that's usually a problem area for most men of color and Latino men as well, represent my, my Latino brothers. Um, it's, it's, you know, but. Again, we had to readapt and, re and, and claim um, European and then fit it to our African body, which is very different. And anybody that knows when you got a suit made and you notice your backside gets a little bit more fatter because we're a little bigger uh, in, that, in those areas. So um, a lot of mistakes, a long journey. Um, I'm a fan of the well-dressed man. Uh, and whether it is leisure style, um, this mashup that you have, which is amazing, I've told you this before, um, and it's an interpretation of bringing back, but it's also bringing to the forefront that this is something that we always did. If you look at the 60s when people marched, and I would look at that and I'd say, man, these people are marching out there, and they look so good, but they want to get beat up, and they got that nice suit on, and they're walking. Why? It was giving us an image. Like, I am just like you. I'm no different than you. And I'm showing you because I'm wearing my best, my Sunday best. On this trip, I'm going to get chased by dogs, beat up, but there's a power in it. It's a style, it's resistance. It's like I am not going to bow down to you. And I'm not going to bow down to anything. I'm going to keep going forward and I'm going to look my best as I go forward.
how we see ourselves as a people. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I love this idea about style or fashioning oneself as being a form of resistance, tutorial practices being a, uh, a form of resistance. The first thing I, I say about black dandyism and, and what I think it does as a form of resistance, as an intervention, is unbind this, this notion that class, and by class I mean like the notion of classic man or classic person, respectable, um, it, 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 it removes that idea from the notion of whiteness. So we think about class or we think about respectability through the gaze of like white supremacy and bourgeois aesthetics. That is to say, to dress classy or to dress respectable is to look like the classic man, which is to look like the white bourgeois respectable man with money in his pocket. Black people refashioning themselves or resisting or, or sort of, to use a word, I was gonna say cuss, but I ain't gonna do that and I'm annoyed by his politics in here. But playing with or toying with those styles is a way of repositioning that. But, but I wanna also think about this in a different way. It is also to say that thuggishness or the thug is not easily mapped onto black people or the hood. Because if that were the case, the thuggery of, let's say, I don't know, the drone attacks coming from the White House, or the thuggery of Trump, or the thuggery of white people, our bourgeois class on Wall Street, these folk are dressed in suits. So this is a way for us to Black dandyism is challenging us to unbind these notions from race and class and asking us to reconsider how our definitions and ideas and representations and perceptions of class, of, of classic, classic, classicness, of uh, respectability are so shaped by a white imaginary that tells us that anything that isn't white, that does not have money, is not classy. Which is to say, the, thuggish, the most thuggish thing I've seen is America in the White House. <laughs> is I come from the hood, and I'm reclaiming that term as a person from Camden, New Jersey, um, as a person who spent a lot of time in Newark, New Jersey, who learned dandyism in Newark. First haberdasheries I went to were in Newark, New Jersey. The first time I got bow ties made there. And it's interesting, the first time I even modeled in a, in a dandy campaign was under the guise of a black woman, dandy, named Kate Ross. In so many ways, what dandyism does is also unmaps this idea that, the, that masculinity is solely the, the domain of male bodies. This is also, A cisgender woman who dons bow ties and it allows us to manipulate and maneuver through the gendered ideas that we're told we're supposed to follow. Those are also uh, you know, the products of a white racial supremacist patriarchal understanding of how we ought to adorn ourselves. When I put on, when I put on, when I adorn myself, it is every time any of us adorn ourselves, it's outright, it's political. Oh, yeah. and, and, you know, you know, I'm able to sort of to sort of mess around with gendered ideas based on how I stylize myself. I will say the danger of, of of these ideas of dandyism that we carry is this: I knew when I was in Newark that if I wore a bow tie and a suit in certain circles, it made me legible in a certain way. It caused people within the community when I was working in politics and organizing to actually read me as having a type of political and social capital. That is to say, they understood me as the right type of black man walking into the room, even if I was gay. Which is to say that if we only understand dandyism through this guise, we do ourselves a disservice. Because what it means is that we're upholding a stale, rigid idea a black masculinity that is solely based on a understanding of cisgender men having to perform a type of bourgeois political capital, politics, in order to see ourselves as having any type of power. So today, I decided not to wear a suit.
representation, representation, part of it is how we style our, stylize ourselves. And it is through that that we can shift gender understandings, understandings of power, and understandings of race. Um, 
I had a rip hip hop group. We used to do um, go around do these rap battles. Um, and then I found my way into corporate America. And the only way for me to be taken seriously, at least what I thought was a way for me to be taken seriously, was to dress like this. And every day I'd go to work for 11 years, just hating that I was fitting into this box. Right? I hated my job. In many cases, I sucked at my job. But because I dressed like this, I was that token. Right? I was the guy who they would, you know, call to show diversity, talk about EEO numbers, all of that. I, 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 I kind of, I agree with Darnell uh, in that this, this, and, and, and this is some of the issues that I have with dandyism uh, as we understand it, or at least as I understand it, is that dressing like this disarms whiteness and I should be allowed to wear my hoodie. I might not like gentlemen who dress or wear sagging pants, right? But they shouldn't have to be killed for dressing that way. Right? It's all about taste. You know, I, I, you know, I'm watching the documentary and they talk about how, you know, Kanye West and Jay-Z, they, they, they swapped out their clothing for business clothing. And I thought to myself, well, when I'm in Lagos doing business, I'm in a nice white taklada doing business, right? We need to also change the language, the adjectives that we use to describe what a respected individual is without having to play into respectability politics. So this is a contradiction of my ideal. Mm -hmm. okay. But I want to add also that it, it isn't just the fabric or the cloth or what you wear. There's other, there's other elements that, that in, if we embody them, you can wear anything you want, hoodie, whatever. And I think it's like a thing that people forget is manners are important. The way you behave, the way you, you carry yourself. And that goes further than sometimes in just a suit. And I think if you uh, uh, are able to express yourself and articulate your position, yes, you can wear whatever you want. I mean, I choose to dress like this because this is, this is what I grew up with my generation. This is what I had when I looked out the window on Sunday. This is what I saw. This is what, you know, at living in Harlem, you know, this is what I saw. This is, a, you know, the, 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 you know, Stacey Adams. I mean, anybody know Stacey Adams? Yeah. Stacey Adams, you wore, you know, you wore your, your, your nice suit. You had your tailor made because we didn't call it bespoke. We called it tailor made. We didn't know we were getting bespoke. We were getting tailor made. Oh, I'm getting the tailor made, man. I'm getting them. I'm getting those bands over here. I'm getting my flaps done over here. I'm gonna get that blind knit for all those that know what a blind knit is. You already know what it is. But, um, so we, you know, we were dressing like this, and, and all this stuff that's coming down now in terms of this free and the Gucci and Gucci sweater, Gucci down to my socks like I'm Big Papa. Yeah. You know, all of that, all of that is, is is part of us, and it's been part of us for a long time. What Chantrell has been able to do is bring it to the forefront and create this conversation that we needed to have. Because we've been dressing like this for a long time. This is nothing new. This is nothing new. Okay? You go back to Detroit in the 60s when cats were wearing those uh, high water skimpy, uh, 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 skin tight uh, pants. And you can research it, so you can look this up. And they had the little uh, shoes, pointy shoes, and they had the stingy brim hats. Uh, Hollow, maybe you know. And I and that was a style. And that was not so, that was a style that we wanted to, just like I wanna add to my ad because we have a couple of minutes. And, and I want I, I was gonna come to you because I do because <laughs> we only have a couple of minutes and we're gonna open it to the audience so we're gonna continue the conversation for a few more moments. But Chantra, I wanted to come back to you and contextualize everything you're hearing because this is your book, right? This is your, your baby, this is your idea. And, uh, but before we play that, I want you, if you can, as you tie it up and we go to questions, can you, again, root it back in the Africanness aspect? Because you talked about the trickster. And what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing as observer, listener, as someone who's read, and then knowing all of you, 
the one thread that I keep coming back to is black people will fly, right? <laughs> like no matter what we rock in, like Darnell, he still fly to them, right? Yeah. And so, my name's Darnell. Everybody calls him Darnell. Yeah, Darnell, my name. So, so, so <laughs> and this idea, this idea of style, and this idea of how we, the style we have is tied to uh, heritage and culture. Can you root that for us and, yeah. and, and ground us, yeah. and, and then we'll open it up. Right. So this is what I need everybody in here to understand about this thing that. Darnell called name to, called white supremacy. What's your name? You got an African name, you got a Yoruba name, you got an Igbo name, you got a Nakai name, a Ghana name, a Fulani name, a Zulu name, or you got a white name, a European name. Your spiritual practices, where they come from? They coming from those same groups of people, like the, the religion that your ancestors practice and, and identify with that freed them in Haiti, right? And every other major revolution, in a new world that was led by practitioners of African spirituality or something else outside of our culture, right? When you dress up, what is whatever it would look like, you know what I mean? Where are you shopping? Where are you buying stuff from? Where are you supporting businesses? All of these things, white supremacy is rooted in all of that. In 2017, we're still naming our children names of, of Europeans and white people. That's white supremacy. You know, and so I think that we can't look at one thing, like pick and choose like how white, white supremacy manifests itself in our lives. And when we send our children to colleges, are we sending them to HBCUs? Do we praise kids when we see those articles that spread around about, oh, this child got all these scholarships to Harvard and Yale and all of these Ivy League schools? Do we do the same when we say our students got accepted into Howard and Tuskegee yes. and FAM yes. and Morehouse and Spelman and Hampton, right? So I think we need to like stay present to that, right? And so the other thing is, like in this book, the reality is blackness is not a monolith. Anything, blackness is everything. If you want to wear green hair, that's black. If you want to be a punk rocker, that's black. You can go into Botswana, they have punk rockers, heavy metal people that are black. We do everything. Like it encompasses everything. Everything comes from us. So even the things that we think came from Europeans actually come from us. We don't know our history is not important to us. We don't, we will we identify punk rockers and like Mohawks and we'll say that's white people stuff. Right? How we do that? And so that's what this is about. This is like blackness is not a monolith. The diaspora is not a monolith. Black America is not a monolith. We got Afro-Americans, Afro-Puerto Rican and Nigerian, you know, black Americans by way of the, the US, you know, slavery system, you know what I mean? And so it's like, you, it's so nuanced, and that's what this is about, and that's why I included Teek Milan in my book, you know what I mean? Because I was like, I'm not gonna have a book about black dandyism and just have cisgender straight black men. as well because the idea is like where do you have straight cisgender men even in conversation with you know same gender loving men when does that conversation happen let alone trans men right and masculine and center women that's all happening in this book so to bring it back to the diaspora and who we are as a people whether in Brixton and New Orleans or Brooklyn or whatever and I've gone to these places because I am a well-traveled woman right <laughs> diaspora, I do diaspora. Right now, my family in the Netherlands is celebrating me right now, because my book is in the Netherlands, that black Dutch community by way of Suriname and Curacao and Aruba. You know what I mean? That diaspora is so, it is so nuanced. There are so many, dandyism is only one story. The bow tie, the Agbada, that's only one story as well. And the thing that I have to say also about the, talking about the, the, the hip hop or excessive pants image, when hip hop first was found, let's, let's get back into that, right? There was diversity in hip hop. You had Jungle Brothers, you had uh, Will Smith, you had New York rappers, you had Southern rappers who were doing something. We were wearing ballets and animal ballets that y'all weren't even wearing in New York because we were doing our own thing in New Orleans. So there were all these diverse styles that existed in this one culture, and then white people came and took it over yeah. and said, This is hip hop, I'm gonna give it back to you, right? Corporate interests that have capitalized the prison industrial complex 
is in bed with hip hop, right? So there are there there's something there's blood tied to a particular type of image of the black man. And so when everybody does this, that's when it becomes a problem. That's when, it, when to express your masculinity means you know excessive wear, extra casual, thug, whatever. That's when it becomes a problem for me. But in, in, in the suit is not bulletproof, and I say that. The suit is not bulletproof. I know too many black men that got pulled over by the police with suits on coming from work. So I just recognize that. But the reality is, I know we gotta ask questions. Shango is taking over right now. Uh, is that we need to do, uh, we have work to do. This is only one story, one very, very small story. We each have stories in our own families and our own communities that need to be told, and if we're not gonna tell them, who will? So, I'm not sure how we're, oh, there's mics at either side. If you have a question to ask the panelists, I don't know how we got into a situation talking about fashion of black people in 30 minutes tonight. But uh, that's the situation we're in right now, so we can go celebrate Chantrell's book downstairs after this. So if you have a question or you have a brief, I would say like 30 second comment, to keep it brief, please go to a microphone. Yes. Hi, my name is Nyla. Hi, Chantrell. Can you share a little bit more? I know you just spoke about how, in this book, you uh, start to explore uh, masculine in a sense of women, right? Um, women in dandyism. Can you talk a little bit more about how you got to that place during this dandy journey? Because as I remember and recall, originally, we, you know, the journey started many years ago really looking at cisgender men. So can you take us a little bit, tell, tell that story a little bit to us. And then your family always want to come and pull your card. So, <laughs> I'm not going to pull all, you know, pull all my tea out on the stage and I pour it all. I'm not going to do that. But I was ignorant at one point in time when I met my older in Brazil. Um, and they had, and Monifa, and they had to get me together about my pockets around black men um, and women, you know, within the queer community and like representation, right? Um, Dream Hampton was how I came to that point. That was the first person. Dream and I, I have clapped for Dream. Dream and I were in Egypt, and she was like, you know you can't have a, a book sis and not have no women in there, right? And I was just like, damn, you're right, you know? And I think initially, I was trying to challenge the homophobic notion that to dress this way means what? Because I think, I know you agree that there have been people who told me in the LGBTQ community that they do dress hyper masculine like this, you know, the more casual, excessive, quote unquote, thug, hard, hyper masculine way because to dress other than that, then their sexuality is in, in question and then it's problematic and that's dealing with all of that. And so, you know, um, so for me, it's like it's so problematic on so many different levels and so nuanced, but it was many a conversation with my friends, Cleaver Cruz, oh. Hakeem Pitts. The, all the children, <laughs> the legendary and up and coming, got me together. So I can't take all that credit about like really having these more like complicated conversations because you can't, you know. Even my my mom, you, I was so butch as a child. Oh my God, Chantrell was so butch, but Chantrell was also very boy crazy. So it took me a while to understand where I'm gonna more dudes if I dress like a girl than a boy. Oh, let me go put on some skirts then, right? But you know, my parents would always say, you know, like, you know, you need to put on a dress. My mom used to get so mad, you know, because I, you know, I, I just did not want to, because I was like, I'm a girl, so if I had this on, my brother's polo and heel figures and jabos, whatever, then I'm, I'm looking like a girl, because this girl is wearing these clothes, right? And then we talk about, like, these gender roles. I am a princess Shango. If you know anything about Yoruba Cosmogy, you know that God, Shango is the god of thunder and lightning. He is as hyper-masculine as it gets. He had three wives, Oya, Oshun, and Oba, right? So there's a grown, the spirit of a grown man inside of me, so when I walk in the world, I'm carrying that Ache in my head, right? You want 
It was, it was a very long journey over seven, a, a seven year period. Okay, thank you. Next question. Hi, Auntie. Uh, <laughs> so I had a, like a question just for everyone about their opinions on something. Like recently, like obviously like more African prints are trending like in this like maybe like two years or so. And there's been a lot of controversy over like if black or African Americans can wear African prints and like if it's appropriation or not. But it's like, it's different in my opinion because like growing up I always had to wear lapas and like wearing my leggies and stuff. I was like ridiculed and I didn't really want to wear them outside as if it's trending now. Like, you know, it's okay for me to wear but I'm afraid like that trend will die. But I just want to know your opinions on like... First of all, you're free to wear whatever the hell you want to wear. This, you know, this conversation came up recently because Beyonce had a African-themed uh, baby shower, yep. and um, there were questions again about can African Americans appropriate African culture? No. And first, I, I, I really I resent this conversation. Right? This is not the discussion that we as Black people need to be having. Yeah. Thirdly, people people grossly under un, uh, misunderstand what appropriation means and it's because it's always juxtaposed to whiteness appropriation is borrowing from one culture of another culture we appropriate each other and that is appreciation that is great when white people appropriate african or black culture is problematic because of the historical context the, the historical subjugation of black people so black people african african american haitian cuban you cannot appropriate negatively your culture it's one culture get out of that conversation about black. I mean, it's really annoying, but just, you know. That's ours, it was ours. We can wear whatever we want when we want to. Are there other questions? If not, then I'm gonna come back to the panel. <laughs> Darnell, I, I, I know you have some more additional thoughts as you listen to this. <laughs> I'm just curious to that last statement and just the whole idea of just like cisgender, how we're talking about masculinity. But, but we forget mom baby. Yeah, we forget her. We forget she was a baby. Go look at her pictures. You can Google it now. You can do Google stuff now. We didn't have to get you in my time. But or know the stuff. Google her and look and see who she was. A dandy. End of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I, end of conversation. <laughs> I, I just think what Chantrell is helping us to do through her project is really, many of us really um, still have trouble distinguishing between gender expression and sexual, ex sexual identity, our sexual desire. Um, so the way that one adorn, one adorn oneself, stylize oneself, sartorial practices does not indicate or overdetermine one's sexual Amen. desires. Um, so that is to say, I can be identified by all of you as a man. I can wear a dress, which is typically assigned to women. That has nothing to do with who's in my bed or what my sexual desires are. So that's the first thing, and this is, this is, I think, really essential because this notion of the tomboy that you bring up, people see, you know, as we identify them, little girls dressed in what is typically a sign for little boys, and we're already over-determining, or making a determination about who they like or what their sexual desires are. Um, so dandyism, like I said before, I think is a play on, it can be a play on gender. Um, and it can be, help us to understand that, you know, these gendered ideas, masculinity suits are not just a part of the manhood experience. And I raise Kate Ross because she is a designer, I have it. She creates bow ties. I mean, you all should Google her um, and see, yes, 
Um, and see what she's doing with dandyism as a way of toying with our understandings of what gender is. This is not really a question about sexuality at all. This is a question about gender and our commitments to the way that we are socialized um, to be men and women, to be masculine and feminine. Um, and if you're nothing else, you're helping us to understand that those lines are meant to be broken. gender neutral styling for men and women. So there's a lot of people that are breaking these barriers down. So they're constantly being broken. And this generation, thankfully, is doing a lot of that. So before we close, thank you. And I want Chantrell to have the last minute to, to close us out and then I'll wrap us up. But I want, if there's any final thoughts you want to share about where they can get the book, where the book is located, Anything, where the, what's next on the tour for the book? Anything that you want to share? Just want to first thank my editor who's in the front row, Denise Wolf. <laughs> She's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Y'all give her a round of applause. <laughs> and Sean and Joshua, the whole Aperture team that's here. Um, this book would not be possible without people believing in my vision, you know, um, and Aperture came along seven years into this project. MOCP, Natasha Egan, who's not here, uh, and Stephanie Conaway from the um, Museum for Contemporary Photography, they also saw my vision. I mean, there's so many institutions. Um, Dr. Michelle Wilkinson from the Smithsonian is in here. She also brought that institution, I mean, the exhibi exhibition to uh, Baltimore, Victor Dayson at El Jaira. I mean, it's like, it's a labor of love that started in black institutions first, and that got bigger and came to the mainstream. And so I think it, it was always, it's always been a political decision of mine to work for predominantly black institutions, the Caribbean Cultural Center, Dr. Martha Moreno Vega, who I could not be here without. I'm helping to draw my work as a curator who's looking at the diaspora. And so uh, I just, you know, all of the photographers, Russell Frederick, you know, I just have to give thanks, uh, Radcliffe Roy, Lena Barron. Um, out of Madhuffi and Fawundu. There's so many people I can't even name. Roger Walker's out there taking pictures. So many people believe in my vision. You know, and it's like, as a black curator, cur this is not, no, listen. Linda. Linda. <laughs> Linda. You know, because your girl, your wife, Rashida Bumbray, who's here, was one of the first curators, the first curator to help me, like, to, to say, like, your voice is valid, right? And I will always be indebted to you for that. And, I, and the reason why I'm shouting these people out is because that's African. You know, you can't come in these spaces, white space like Brooklyn Museum, and then like just be beyond yourself and forget where you came from. Like, I can't do that. So that's, I got here from the Jenkins, not the Joneses. The Jenkins got me here. So um, you asked me where to get the book. You can get it from my publisher's website, Aperture. You can go to the store. There are also lots of other booksellers online that's carrying the books. They're back in stock. Uh, and um, I always want you to pick up this book. I remember when Javel Shabazz did back in the days, and I walked into Urban Outfitters. This is right after I graduated from Howard. And that was the first time I'd seen black people in that way as art. And I, of course, I've been exposed to like Aaron Douglas and Jacob Lawrence and all these people because of my parents. But in terms of like street, like just an everyday black person, as art, that was the first time. And then I was introduced to Dr. Deb Willis's work and saw those, those photographs you know, on a, a museum wall. And so I was like, I want this book to do it back in the days there for our community around the globe. And it can only do that if you go and get the book, right? Get that book, give it to your sons, your daughters, your grandfathers, your uncles, your moms, white folks, other black folks, Latinos, Asians. I mean, there's so many points of entry, and there's so many stories, and it's just interesting, right? Not just my own personal story, but the story of so many other people. So it's not, I'm like, I'm lifting us all up. This is like my labor of love to black folks. Like, I, I, I blood, sweat, and tears, trust me. Yes, has gone into thank this project. You. So I just want to say thank you so much, thank Rasheed, you. and everybody. Thank you. Thank you.
give us directions, but I want to say, please follow all these, Google all these people, they're amazing. Darnell's now at Cashes, which is a new uh, platform that is very amazing. So I want to shout them out. Uh, Ignacio's always doing great work. You could Google, he's writing some great things. And obviously, OK, Africa, Abiolo's doing great work. And the Campaign for Black Men Achievement. And uh, the Museum. And the Brooklyn Museum. And thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Thank you. I know that um, our photographers want to take a photo with the, the title slide in the background, so if we could just... Um, so my name is Alicia Boone. I'm an associate curator of public programs here at the Brooklyn Museum. And to, to produce programs like this is like my joy and my, my love. And I hope that you will, all of the individuals that are in here tonight, I hope that you will continue to support Chantrell and her vision and as it grows. And I really want to see this exhibition here at the museum. Wow. Real talk. So, Pleasure to see you grow and flourish, and I look forward to continuing to support you on your path as you continue. You're amazing. So everybody, the book is for sale downstairs, and um, we are doing a book signing with Chantrell in the lobby, where Gigi Sabine is spinning, courtesy of OK Africa. I want to definitely thank Rashid Shabazz and his team. So it was a definitely collaborative effort between Chantrell, Campaign for Black, Black Male Achievement, and as well as Aperture and OK Africa. So thank you, everybody.